What's up everyone? I'm Matt Martin with The Grass Factor and today I wanted to do a video about our product we call X-Soil. In this video I wanted to cover some key features about our product, what it accomplishes and what differentiates itself from other products similar to it on the market. Number one, the first thing I want to clarify is that not all biochar is necessarily equal or equivalent. Now, I'm not necessarily going to say one is better than the other. What I do want to clarify, though, is that when it comes to biochar, it's a bit of a catch-all phrase, a lot like nitrogen would be. The difference is, is that when you're talking about nitrogen, you have all these different forms, right? You've got urea nitrogen, you've got organic nitrogen, you've got nitrate nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen, you know, what kind of nitrogen is it? It's kind of the same thing. The term biochar is just a very big catch-all phrase. Because when you start looking at biochar and what it actually accomplishes, it all depends on the characteristics of that biochar and the variables that influence the different characteristics of the biochar. For example, biochar that is uh, pyrolyzed at a very high temperature, we're talking 1,000 to 1,200 degrees Celsius, is extremely high in carbon and has one set of, uh, of characteristics versus a biochar that is pyrolyzed at a very low temperature. Typically, you're going to see a higher uh, a cation exchange capacity at lower temperatures. You're going to see a higher surface area at higher pyrolysis temperatures. Then it comes into what is the source material. Certain source materials are going to have different characteristics as well. You'll have higher cation exchange capacities out of softwood. You're going to have higher anion exchange capacities out of hardwood. Uh, when you're talking about anion exchange capacity, you have the highest rated anion exchange capacities out of corn stovers. So depending on what your feedstock is and what your pyrolysis temperature is, you're going to get a different set of characteristics. So when you're choosing to use a biochar product, it's important that you understand which characteristics you're getting out of which product, and therefore understanding the manufacturing process, the source material, and the pyrolysis temperature that influences your specific biochar you're using. Second, when it comes to granulating anything, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about poultry litter or we're talking about biochar that's been co-composted with poultry litter or we're talking about ammonium sulfate, whatever the case may be, the material has to be micronized in order to agglomerate it. So what we do is, and I'll show you here, we invested a lot of time into particle size reduction technology. Yeah, so we're thinking just wider throat, straight shoot, Teflon, or some kind of low friction coefficient coating on it to just give us the highest probability of beating it. It's, it's money. Yeah, right?
And basically it's the way we figured out what was going to be the most efficient method to micronizing our material. You're not just grinding it into a fine powder, you're taking it down to the micron scale, oftentimes smaller than 100 micron. This material granulates more consistently and thus produces a more consistent final product. The second advantage of working with micronized material means it's going to break down and react in the soil faster. So it's important that you choose a material that has been micronized. Three, one of the often discussed and rarely understood concepts of this is the importance of co-composting the material uh, with biochar and why you need to do this. The most inconsistent studies related to biochar revolve around using raw biochar as a soil amendment. And it doesn't matter whether you've started with low rates or you've gone with really high rates, there is a certain level of inconsistency with that type of product. And the reason why is, remember me talking about the cation exchange capacity and the anion exchange capacity? Depending on your source material, if you're extremely high in cation exchange capacity, it will adsorb everything out of the soil to the point and to keep it away from the plant. So for instance, a cation exchange capacity, a rich biochar is going to absorb your cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and rob those from being available to the plant. The trick becomes how do you make it available again? If you're using a high anion exchange capacity, you can rob your anions, nitrogen, phosphorus, molybdenum, and hide those from the plant as well. So it's one thing to apply biochar to the soil, to the soil in any form and have it in the soil to do its adsorptive function or act as a coral reef or however you want to say it. And it can adsorb all those things really, really well. But the trick becomes how do you get it to release again? If you leave it up to the natural soil processes, it takes time, heat, and friction in order for that to happen. So through the natural movement of soils, whether through compaction or rainfall or earthworms or whatever the case may be, you might have release occur in that situation. The only way to truly guarantee the release of that material is through a co-composting process. We can talk about this study here. It was identified by the University of Minnesota that the only way to ensure adequate and predictable release for using biochar in terms of slow release capabilities, it had to have been co-composted with, an, in this particular instance, in a poultry manure source. Thus, that's why we chose to use this material in this way. Our early efforts in biochar research, we continually accidentally killed plants by using raw micronized biochar. The absorptive capacity of micronized biochar is just too strong. And it doesn't just have to be micronized, it could be any biochar. So what we found is that you can circumvent this by running extremely low rates of it, but we also found that you could add a layer of performance and predictability by co-composting with a manure source. Application-wise, where and why to use a product like Exoil? I recommend this product when you are going through either some sort of establishment or you're looking to put the lawn on autopilot of sorts. And what I mean by that is I take back, in fact, if you look through my video history, one of the very first videos I ever put on YouTube, I had top dress with mushroom compost, a property in residential lawn care. And I was going back and I was admiring the work. One of the things I noticed after years of doing that was for the remainder of the year, there wasn't really anything I needed to do to that property. Uh, the, weed, the weed pressure I faced had dropped significantly. Um, the amount of wire, water required to maintain turf health uh, dropped significantly. And so I wanted a product though that was actually granulated that I could spread through a traditional spreader so I didn't have to use a wheelbarrow and shovel, you know, 
dozens of yards of compost across the property. It would have been much easier for me if I could have just filled bags in a hopper and gone out and spread it. That was the inspiration behind the product. And that's why when you look at the ingredients in the products, it's basically developing my own compost in a granulated form to be able to use in these types of scenarios. So whether maintaining a lawn, you can do so at a spring and during a summer at a very high rate and get down adequate compost to improve soil structure and improve plant, uh, plant performance. All of that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, you could also use it at time of establishment in very difficult soil. So we'll say a new construction where you're dealing with lots of new construction and you're working really hard and it's difficult for you to get uh, to the point with the soil to be able to make it uh, actually grow anything. In that instance, it's a good fit. Or if you're transplanting plants, say you've got a new landscape installation that you're undergoing and you know you're going to be planting into uh, less than optimal soil, it makes sense to use that product then. Now, you have to understand, it's not a fertilizer. This is not something you're putting out at a high rate and uh, at, a, at a low rate, and you're gonna get some tremendous visual response from it. Now, being that it is an actual granulated compost, you will get a color response from it. However, that is going to be on the higher end of the spectrum. It may take 20, 30, 40 pounds per thousand square feet in order to get a color response. So I hope you've learned something a little bit about biochar and a little bit about our X-Soil product today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free, ask them in the comments below, and I'll do everything I can to help you out. Thanks.